So Jennifer Aitley is a reporter, or was a reporter at the New York Times, where she covered culture, poverty, and technology. Her book, The Fortune Cookie Chronicles, Adventures in the World of Chinese Food, was published in 2008 and became a New York Times bestseller. She is an advisor to Upworthy and the co-founder and CEO of Plimpton, a literary studio that focuses on publishing serialized fiction on digital platforms. She produced the documentary, the, documentary, the Search for General Tsao, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival last year. She is the daughter of Chinese immigrants who grew up in New York eating her mother's authentic Chinese food. And tonight she brought with her a friend from junior high school, um, Sewell Chan, <laughs> who, who, who identifies himself not just as her friend from junior high school. No, that, that, but that actually is the primary that is, affiliation. That's like your Twitter identifier. Um, he has worked for the New York Times since 2004. In February 2011, he was named deputy opinion page editor of the Times. He was previously a Washington correspondent covering economic policy. From 2007 to 2009, he was the founding bureau chief of City Room, the newspaper's local news blog. He grew up in Flushing, um, and they both graduated from Hunter High School and Harvard College. So not all, their junior high school friendship was so strong, they, they carried that through. So we're so excited to have them here in conversation about this really exciting topic. And we're so excited that you're here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. When I uh, got an email a couple of weeks ago asking me if I would um, agree to uh, moderate a talk with uh, Jenny Lee on Wednesday, April 1st, <laughs> first thought that went through my head was, this is some kind of joke. <laughs> I had to like, check, what the, 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 was the email address legit? <laughs> um, Jenny and I have been friends for uh, more than 25 years, and uh, I, uh, I'm a giant fan of her book, of course I'm biased. And I saw the film at its, uh, at its premiere, and I highly recommend watching it and reading the book. Um, I'm honored to be here for several reasons. Uh, this is one of my favorite institutions in New York City, uh, along with the Eldridge Street Synagogue, Ellis Island. Um, not many places really exceed this institution in terms of how moving it relates, how moving it is in relating the story of migration to America and the children of migrants. I'm a child of immigrants, uh, as is Jenny, and it's very, very uh, powerful to be here today. Uh, so um, what we're going to do is Jenny's actually going to show uh, a few clips from this wonderful documentary uh, that came out last year. And uh, then we're just going to have a pretty free-flowing Q&A. I have a bunch of questions, and I hope that you'll have many of your own. That sounds good. Um, so as um, was mentioned, I produced, I was the producer in a documentary, The Search for General um, So. And, um, the director is Ian Cheney, and so most of the credit goes to him. The, the, one of the things that the producers do is they just sort of raise money and then give it to talented people, which uh, I managed to do here. So, uh, you know, one of the biggest mysteries, of course, about this chicken dish is like, how the hell do you pronounce his name properly? Um, and so, and like, who was he, right? And the just to give you some background on on the documentary, um, I had independently thought like, oh. It would be really cool to do a documentary on, you know, Chinese food. Why I was doing research for the book, and then quick, quickly, quickly realized that you cannot do both at the same time because the way you do research for a book is fundamentally different than uh, the way you do research for a documentary. One is, you know, primarily visual. You actually want things to be very simple, whereas a book, you know, is primarily text, and you are trying to get a lot of nuance. And so I was like, screw that, and uh, stopped. I had I had spent like a couple hundred dollars on like getting like fancy microphones and like a camcorder and like all of those tapes are like kind of still somewhere gathering dust. Um, and so my book came out in 08 and then randomly out of the blue in 09, I get an email from Ian and one of his collaborators that said um, that they had long been thinking about um, doing a documentary called The Search for General So. And so I immediately knew that we were on the same wavelength because the original name of my book was The Long March of General So. Which and is a title yeah. I love. To this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know there were. It w I still think it would have been uh, a great title for the book, um, but it's an, it remains the name of a chapter. And so, uh, Ian and Kurt um, had done a documentary called King Corn right before then, which had been very popular, very well received, and won a Peabody Award, which is one of the highest. Um, sort of honors in broadcasting. And as soon as I saw that and I saw their sense of humor, like we 
basically realized that we were very much on the same wavelength. So that, that was a collaboration that started basically in 2009, and it showed last year in Tribeca almost exactly a year ago. So documentaries take a really long time. Um, and so, you know, the reason that they had started thinking about doing it was they really wondered, you know, while they were going through, I, I think it was Ohio one night, eating this dish, like, who was General So? And this is a question not that they just have, but, like, a lot of people have obviously sort of, like, uh, sort of want, wondered about it. And so uh, the first clip actually kind of is a, is a very fun sort of man on the street uh, sort of review of like who was General So and what do people think of him? Let's see. I must have 15 different spellings of So in my menu collection. It's T-S-O, so it's Sal. How do I pronounce it again? I, I don't know if you say the T or not. I just kind of blur it and that way no one really knows if I'm saying it right or not. But I get mine over brown rice. It's my healthy thing for the day. Well, up in Chico, they call it General Chicken. You know, it's called, been called General Toes. It's been called, I think the Naval Academy calls it Admiral Toes. I feel like no matter what restaurant you go to, there's always a different spelling of General So. So, so there's a lot to find out about him. I have no clue who he is. I guess he must have came up with the, uh, the recipe himself. I think he was a, a general in the Chinese army that, during the time of Chairman Mao or something. And that was his favorite dish, and they named it after him. He uh, had his uh, private chef cook this dish, you know, uh, even when he went to battle. I don't think it was a dish that was made for that general. Maybe it was made in honor of him 100 years after his death. I think they just named it because it sounds exotic after somebody nobody's ever heard of. I imagine General So is almost a bearded Mongolian warrior. He's on a horse, for sure, riding wildly. He's a general, so he obviously has a hat and he has a military uniform. But maybe it's bulging a little bit because he's so chubby from eating all of that chicken. Beautiful armor, you know, with jade maybe and gold pieces. He probably looks kind of fancy with an army of thousands. Did he love chicken? We don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, and so, oh yeah, so his, his, so General So is a real guy. Uh, his name is, in Chinese, it's Zhuo Zhongtang, which, um, and he was a Qing Dynasty military hero that played an important role in the Taiping Rebellion, which was a civil war that was started by a Chinese guy who thought he was the baby brother of Jesus Christ. Um, and that civil war actually killed 20 million people and still the deadliest civil war in like world, you know, history until this day. And so one of the more interesting things in terms of the, um, the book and the documentary is it, we gathered each other by like, I mean, I probably went to uh, General Tso's hometown in 07, and then we went again in 2012, I think it was, 2012, two years ago. Describe this town in Hunan province. What, uh, <laughs> help people here who haven't been to China picture what it's, what, what it's like and what it's become. Well, when I first went there, it was like nothing. I mean, it was, I mean, there, I mean, there were chicken crossing the road, basically, and um, and it was three hundred members of General Tso's family, like hanging out in like rural nothingness. And, um, and how many years uh, uh, passed before your next visit? So then, twenty twelve. I'm trying to think. Is it twenty fifteen? Twenty thirteen? Maybe twenty thirteen. Twenty. I think it was twenty thirteen. So two years, right? So. Um, it's actually only been two, uh, so it was 07 to 2013. So that's um, basically six years, a little bit less than that, because I went fall and they went in the winter. Um, and so it's actually kind of really amazing what the, you know, when I went there, um, they were, there were these like kind of rural hicks talking about like, you know, General So and like how important he was. And they were like not surprised I had come there because after all he's world famous right and I didn't have the heart to tell them like why he was famous in the United States <laughs> and um and so they were just talking like we should do a museum and like you know we should have you know like concert and I was like yeah I was like yeah 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 like you know good luck with that and then you go uh in 2012 and then this is basically what we found actually so clip two Chickens. Lots of chickens. They were just like, you know, 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 they were just like, you
哦，坐着哪去啊？啊，啊有叫宫保鸡。没有，我就坐南区的，黄少熙，还晓得？哦，是坐上何许人也不晓得。哦，就是、这样的。他们就那个寻到坐镇堂。哦哦，就寻到坐镇堂。嗯，这就坐镇堂大酒店。老板，左正堂的酒拿过来。他们是从美国过来，这群左正堂的徒弟。嗯，这是英雄的酒，左正堂酒。左正堂喝的肯定是喝白酒，但是绝对不是这种酒，那个时候还没出来不。现在是一种文化，喝这个酒是想到左正堂，不代表左正堂喝这个酒的。这是左宗棠幼儿园，这就是左宗棠生平逝去陈列馆，这就是左宗棠广场，这里就是左宗棠的故居。So to their credit, they really took General Tao's brand and just like ran with it. And um, and actually, to a certain extent, one of the more, more interesting things I've seen in the United States is how many brand extensions General Tao has moved on to beyond just like the chicken. Can I interrupt for a moment, yeah. though? Sorry, can people hear me? Um, do you think his popularity in China is just because there's more domestic tourism within China and more of an interest in imperial history? Yeah, yeah. I actually don't think he's that popular within China. It's sort of like he's like the equivalent of General Sherman. So it was like General Sherman really popular here. Are we like flocking to General Sherman's? Well, life? Atlanta certainly not. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. So I mean, that's because basically what General Tao did was basically he like killed a bunch of people to keep a country together. Right. So that's what he's known for. And so I mean, I think part of that just reflects the money. It, it was it was the hundredth anniversary. 100th anniversary of his death, I think it was, and so, or his, or 200th of his birth. It was, it was one, it was some kind of centennial thing, and it, I think it just re reflects the money that's now in China, and so they just, they don't have a lot going on in that part of the Hunan province, so they like really plowed it into so, the general. I mean, I think he's much more famous <laughs> here, and it's the same province that Mao Zedong is from. Yes, yeah, so it's actually very interesting. Hunan province actually Somewhat has a known. lot <laughs> of, I know, you know, this is one of the things I would say. I bet you. Yes, Chairman Mao is probably better known, but I bet you General Tao's name is actually spoken more times in the United States on a daily basis. <laughs> right? True. Yeah, and so. So uh, let's break down for a moment. Was yeah. General Cho, uh, Zuo, Zuo. Right? Zuo. Was General Zuo, Zuo. <laughs> uh, was he as good a cook as he was a fighter? I actually, I mean, he's a man, so he, at that, during that era, so like he probably didn't cook, but he was a very, very good fighter. He's a very, he was like actually quite a good warrior, um, and sort of ascended uh, up the ranks through a mix of like you know political, sh you know, being very shrewd politically and actually being a good warrior. I, and I know you're asked this a lot, but given Colonel Sanders, what is this connection? Yeah. Between military and poultry. Yeah, yeah. So it's really interesting because you know. What's up with that? Because, because, because in China. <laughs> I know, no, it's really cool. So, because it, it, it was actually really interesting because, you know, when I first went there, um, you know, they're talking to me about, like, General Sao, you know, Sao's, like, victories. And, I, and you kind of realize that in general, in America, uh, General Sao's, like, Colonel Sanders, like, he's known for chicken and not war. But in China, he's actually known for war and not chicken, right? And so um, <laughs> what we found um, was, <laughs> actually, when I was there, they had... Um, signs for dog, they eat dog in that part of China. And so I was just like, ooh, General Tao's puppy would just like not fly here at all in the United States. But so, so the chicken, the, his chicken dish is actually not known at, at all. And when I first went to China, um, in my, my first trip, I would take pictures of General Tao's chicken and show it to Chinese people. And they were like really confused, right? Cause it doesn't, I mean, they're like, is this Chinese food? Cause it doesn't look like Chinese food to them. And so um, as a result, the, what we found with you know General Tsao's chicken, they they've kind of named museums after him. But here, like you can get General Tsao's potato chips. There's General Tsao's dumpling. I've seen General Tsao's po' boys. There's General Tsao's pizza. I mean, they've we've really kind of I don't know. I mean, he's kind of he's kind of like run rampant actually using his name or people or there's counterfeitness. I I don't know exactly what know what's going on, but there's a lot of General Tsao because he he's sort of an interesting shorthand for like Asian. Right, generic Asian, sweet fried chicken, yeah. Um, so I'm trying to remember the third. Oh, so one of the interesting things that, you know, we went on this search 
for the general, but we were also trying to figure out also the mystery behind a dish. So it's actually two stories. And we, we were able actually to uh, figure out that the home of General Tso's Chicken actually started very much in New York City. So New York City is actually the spiritual home of, uh, is ground zero for this dish. And we found the man who kind of made it the, the recipe popular in clip three. Early in 1970, the Eyewitness News team decided, here's a new feature. It'll be called the Eyewitness News Gourmet. We'd go to visit a restaurant once a week and would film the preparation of one of their signature dishes. And I'd heard that there was this hot new Chinese chef in town. He'd come to New York from Taiwan. So we went to meet uh, Chef Peng and film the dish. This is Bob Lee from Channel 7 Eyewitness News. He was this long, skinny fellow, spoke not a word of English. He knew precisely what he was there to do, which was to cook. He came out into the dining room where we had wheeled this display cart full of pre-chopped ingredients so that he could just go bing, 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 bing. And he would throw them into the wok one after the other, give them a quick stir, and you'd get the sizzle of the oil, and you'd get the cloud of steam rising that you could smell. And he just whipped through that dish in the wok with all sorts of elements and colors and textures. We put it on the air, and it was over a thousand requests for that particular recipe. Yeah, and from there, that was around roughly 1973, like, uh, his march started and it didn't stop. Um, so by, like, 1983, the dish was um, essentially available coast to coast. So it took about 10 years. Um, and so one of the interesting things uh, about um, that, when we found, when I found, you know, Chef, there was this man named Chef Pung, was if you do the math, like, he he's he was going to be pretty old by the time uh, if he were still alive. And so it was actually quite hard to track him down. But it turns out that uh, he's still alive. He lived in Taipei, and he played a lot of mahjong um, and gambled. He had come to New York, though, in he the He had 70s? come to New York and in then the, returned to Taiwan? And then returned to Taiwan in part, uh, I think... We don't ever say this, but he had gambling problems. Um, and so somehow the, the financial stability of the restaurant and the gambling didn't quite work. But um, I was no so... No amount of chicken could cover the dish. No amount of chicken. The chicken was like really popular. Henry Kissinger really loved the dish, in fact. But, um, you know, there were copycats at a certain point. So it wasn't like he was the only place. So through some hard work and digging and reporting, uh, we traced him, uh, you know, to uh, Taipei. And he was just hanging out. So he was like 93 when we met him. So uh, I think this is him, hopefully. Yeah, no broccoli. <laughs> Yeah, and so we um, traced it back, and of course he was a little bit like, what the hell is this? And so we actually tried the original General's House chicken, which is not sweet, not fried, and has a lot of skin and bone. It doesn't really resemble um, what we eat here. Um, but you know what does resemble General's House chicken? Chicken McNuggets. And there's actually, it's funny, one of the segments in uh, the documentary is a family that sort of says McDonald's came to visit their um, restaurant a long time ago, and then like a couple years later came out, which, you know, 
chicken McNuggets, which are fried sweet and chicken, right? If you and if you think about the sauces that originally came with General's House Chicken, one was like sweet and sour, and the other one was like hot mustard. Like coincidence, we think not. So. Uh, <laughs> So, so anyway, so those are our clips, and it's a fantastic documentary, and I can say that mostly because I didn't actually, uh, I didn't actually do that much in making it. It's uh, a ninety-four percent on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, which is a testament to Ian's uh, skilled filmmaking. Wonderful film, Jenny. I have a bunch of questions, and I hope our audience will have some too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in your book you say that there's uh, more Chinese restaurants in America than there are McDonald's, Burger King, and KFC combined. And Wendy's. You can throw Wendy's and in Wendy's, there. Yeah, okay. you got a lot of headroom in now, there. I personally <laughs> have seen, and I think sent you photos of, Chinese restaurants in places like Iraq, yeah. Ka Kosovo, Jordan. Yeah. Um, what do you think explains, just on a, ma on a macro level, the ubiquity of, of, uh, of, of Chinese cuisine worldwide? Yeah, so one... Um, China is the number one immigrant producing like country in the world, and so where they land, they cook, right? And so it's really interesting um, from a, w w what I actually ended up doing when I, when I started doing research for the book is it ended up being a really interesting window into the Chinese diaspora around the world. And it's like actually really weird to see like Peru Peruvian Chinese and like Indian Chinese because they're like Indian, right? They speak Hindi fluently, they wear the gold chains, they can they dance Bhangra, and it's like really freaky actually. And um, and then it kind of made me realize that I was really, really American because mm -hmm. the way that my body moves and the way that I hold myself is actually more emblematic of being American than in someone who is Chinese. But um, what you find actually is that in countries where racism wasn't as much of a problem, so these are mostly the Southeast Asian countries, so like, you know, Philippines, um, Indonesia, Thailand, you, you, you often hear that like, you know, 10% of the country owns 90% of the property and those tend to be ethnic Chinese, which I think is really but interesting. But doesn't that produce a lot of ethnic conflict? Total ethnic conflict, but interesting because they, they kind of went into you know into trade and business. Oh, whereas so they're not as restaurant. They're not They didn't end up going to restaurant tours. So where you see Chinese people doing a lot more restauranting is where uh, they they where racism became actually was was actually a much huge, huge you know it's a, it's a much more significant problem. So, um, you know what we get into in the book and in the movie is this idea that when the Chinese actually first came to America, uh, you know Americans didn't eat Chinese food right because they thought these strangers on their shores ate cats, if not cats they ate dogs, if not dogs they ate rats. And there's actually an article from like 1884 from the New York Times that the headline is do the Chinese eat rats? And like they send a reporter out to the kitchens to see if there's evidence of rats. I mean, this is like hardcore reporting. I mean, in for the New York Times back then, and the guy came back and said there was no evidence of rats to be found. <laughs> I mean, you know, thank God, you know, thank God. Um, but, you know, it just reminds you that like in, the, in you know, the, the Chinese food is weird. I mean, they call it like, it was, you know, there was these things called bean cheese, right? I mean, they just, they ate with rice. I mean, they ate rice with sticks. It was like kind of creepy. So, I mean, Jenny, one of the things that you explore, especially in the book, is the way that Chinese food in America, its history, is tied up not only with the history of our country generally, but also with the history of immigration. Right. And um, chi Chinese immigration to America has, is, has a very long history, and there's a wonderful show at the New York Historical Society right now that I'd really recommend. But it's also gotten increasingly diverse. Um, the kind of older Cantonese immigrants, like my, my parents, for example, my dad was a restaurant worker in Chinatown for 15 years. Um, they are kind of the old, the aging generation. It's now immigrants from Fujian province. It's also professionals. It's also the hundreds of thousands of uh, Chinese uh, students from mainland China who come to American universities every year. A friend of mine who teaches at a formerly all, almost entirely white liberal arts college in Eastern Maryland was telling me the other day that Indians and Chinese together are now a fifth of the student body. This is a very, very small, small liberal arts school. As the immigration changes, is that changing uh, how Chinese food is made, uh, how yeah. it's made, prepared, and and seen in America? Oh yeah, I think um, I think definitely right because the the first wave of Chinese food, so the very very first wave was like Chinese food for Chinese people, right? The bean cheese and and soy, sauce. and then basically what you found was it when Chinese got shut out of a lot of other industries, whether or not it's you know working for factories or working um, in agriculture, they actually had the shift into restauranting in part because it was um, 
so restaurants and laundries were the two fields that Chinese went into, in part because those are both women's work and thus not threatening to American mm. men. Mm. Um, and so then they had to adapt. And so along came dishes like chop suey, which we say is like the proto, um, proto general's house chicken in that it was this sort of combination of like being just exotic enough and just like American enough that it was safe. And that's sort of the formula that ch Chinese restaurateurs have used over and over again. And um, then what you have now is because you have all the Chinese immigrants in, especially in university towns, you'll find really authentic Chinese restaurants that are actually catered to Chinese people. And, and there are a couple little ways that you can tell. Um, so one is like, I would say like, you know, does it have jellyfish on the menu? If it has jellyfish on the menu, that is for Chinese people, right? Because Americans don't eat things that are jiggly and transparent unless it's jello. Um, and then another thing is um, lamb. So you you, wouldn't, you will not actually usually find lamb on uh, restaurants that are targeted at, China, at um, Americans, whereas Chinese people actually do eat lamb partially from, from the Muslim influence. So like another good, you know, a good rule and actually in life, um, especially if you're in a foreign country, if you're looking for a place to eat, go where Asian people are waiting online. Do you think Americans are becoming more sophisticated about Chinese food? I mean, one thing I've noticed, um, my parents live in Flushing, Queens, which along with Sunset Park, you know, there are basically three yeah. Chinatowns now in New York City. And you know, only in the last few years, when we were kids, you, know, you would never have seen in New York Magazine a guide <laughs> to the Chinese restaurants of Flushing. And, the, and I mean, I, I sense among non-Chinese, non non-Asian American friends, an interest in cuisine from Yunnan province, which is... There's so actually a restaurant near here, in rural, a, a Yunnan fairly Yunnan. rural province in the southwest, or food from Xinjiang, which is uh, the northwestern, the vast northwestern region, or Manchurian cuisine. Uh, when I went to Beijing, I, you know, American friends took me to places that served so-called imperial cuisine. People know their Sichuan from their Shanghai now. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you think that's a... It's, is, I mean, am, am I overstating that, or is that... I mean, in, I think in general, Americans are just, like, becoming more obsessed with food in general, right? right? And so, more food conscious. And then, right, more food conscious. And there's like Chinese food is like one of the areas where you can really, really obsess about and be like all snobby about like, oh, you know, I, I, I had that dish, you know, when I was taking the railroad, like, you know, into, to Kashgar, right, big plate chicken or something like that. And so um, it's one of the ways that um, we've moved sort of to an experiential, like instead of, instead of showing off... Um, through goods, right? Like car, especially like in New York, we're like, we don't drive anywhere. Things. It's experiences, not things. So sort of showing that you're worldly about food, whether or not it's Italian food or Ethiopian food or Chinese food is, is, is but one of things. objectively, does that, do you think the food has gotten better just as perhaps yester, yesteryear's red sauce Italian is perhaps today a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, it's, I think food generally is a reflection of leisure class, right? So it turns out, uh, communism for 50 years in China, like really bad for like cooking on mainland, like mainland cuisine kind of like took a nosedive, um, kind of in that like post Mao era. Where in contrast, actually most of the innovation in sort of global qu quality Chinese cuisine took place in Taiwan, because what happened is all the, right. all the chefs of all of the military people like ran to Taipei, and then they, they actually reflected um, a, a huge multitude of cuisine styles, and it kind of became this interesting melting pot in Taipei during that time. So Taipei, Taipei in that you know, 1950, 1960, kind of uh, 70, 80 era was sort of the hotbed of innovation. Whereas um, now, because China has a lot of money, you see sort of the rise of Chinese cuisine in China again, which hadn't been the case that's, for a long time. It's more time. discerning and more Yeah, just like, you know, uh, shark fin, a bowl of shark fin soup for $100. So here's one, another question. And um, why does Chinese food not have a kind of haute cuisine tradition in America. You know, when you look at some of the most expensive restaurants in New York, and I'm not at all suggesting that's necessarily a measure of quality, but it's just uh, you, the five-star restaurants, the places that are Michelin-starred, tend to often be French, Japanese. I'm trying to think, there are maybe some other examples. Uh, cuisines that are certain, cer sort of seen as haute yeah. cuisines, as high cuisines. Um, perhaps Turkish is in that category in some in some instances. Indian, I sense less so. But what do you, what do you think has prevented? You know, why isn't there yeah. kind of a Michelin starred, or maybe there is one? Uh, I mean, if there was, there wasn't at the time that I was writing my book. There, okay. If there has been, 
recently. I've kind of missed it. But um, What explains that omission? So there are a couple things that are going on. This is very specific to the United States. Um, one is that our visas kind of suck. Or immigration visas actually suck for people who are very highly skilled as chefs, right? Ah. So, ah. so our visa system um, favors. Uh, so you know, there's H-1B. So that's sort of a technical visa. I think my dad might have come here. So a lot of Silicon Valley workers are there. Then there's um, an O visa, which is sort of like the genius visa, which is you know like scientists and like um, sometimes like you know our, you know like film directors and like under Clinton models were actually added to that um, to the O visa category. So the thing is, most most highly regarded chefs are um, not necessarily college educated. I mean, they, they may be brilliant, but it's it's a lot harder to show that you are. So um, what you have instead is some of the most interesting innovation happening in places like Canada, because mm. mm. you know they they can bring they're in Vancouver specifically because there's a lot of money there that's you know flowed from Hong Kong and they demand good food. Um, like Singapore and uh, Malaysia, London very interestingly had a lo- has has some of some of the best restaurants in London are actually Chinese. So there's a guy named Alan Yao who has you know a string of um, of fancy restaurants, actually Hakkasan, which actually has now come to the United States, originally came from London. Um, and uh, where else do you see Dubai? That was really weird, actually. Dubai, Dubai is actually one of the most interesting places to eat in the world because the native population of, um, I guess, Emirates are fifty are. It's only 15%. So there's no native palate to dumb down to, if that makes sense. So when you have, you have like two phenomenon since so many workers are coming from around the world. One, which is very, very specific localized cuisine. So it's like northern Iraqi cuisine, right? So you're, because you're cooking for the northern Iraqi workers who are there. Or you have global, like, you know, ambitious cuisine because of the amount of money that's there. So you get this like really interesting kind of buy bimodal distribution. And so Dubai is one of the most fun places to kind of just go out and eat from a high low perspective. Um, whereas in the United States, what happened was like, you know, during during the era actually of um, General Tso's chicken and Chef Pong, that was high cuisine. Like there was, you know, like um, Shun Li was, which I just went to recently, which was like kind of weird. It's like very retro. It's an interesting, it was, was the fancy place, right? And there were, um, the one in the West sixties, the one in the West sixties. Yeah. And, um, you know, where my friend always, one of my friends for families always gets their Shabbat dinner delivered from there. Actually, <laughs> uh, it's very popular for among certain communities, you know? And so, um, actually it's, it's funny. One of my favorite chapters in my book is about Jews and Chinese food, well, and it's called Why is Chow Mein the Chosen Food of the Chosen People? Um, and which I think is like very resonant. Well, that was my next here. question with Passover coming up. Um, you know, this, this sort of, you know, the stereotype, although it has some truth to it, like many stereotypes yeah. of, you know, Jews get a gathering on Christmas Day for, you know, Chinese, oh, yeah, take, not a stereotype. True. Chinese yeah, takeout true. in a movie. <laughs> Um, what what especially in New York explains the kind of popularity of, of Chinese food uh, or the perceived popularity of Chinese food among um, among Jewish Americans? Jews. I know, and this is actually one of the best places to talk about it. Um, so it's funny. One of the things that we did right before uh, the movie came out is we actually had a Christmas Day showing of this documentary at the JCC on the Upper West Side, and 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 it was. I mean, first of all, completely packed, and then secondly, like. Um, full of parents of our, our like classmates from elementary school and junior high school. It was like really, it was like, these were my people. Right. And so, um, it was really fun. So part of it is, um, Jews and Chinese are two largest non-Christian immigrant groups, uh, to America. So in many ways, Chinese restaurants are open when Jews wanted to eat, which was Sundays and, you know, Christmas, now in the era of like 24-hour ATMs and 1-800 numbers, we forget like things shut down, you know, a long time ago. So if you wanted to go out on Sunday for food, like Chinese restaurants were open, so that's one. Um, two, Chinese food doesn't use dairy, unlike um, so unlike Mexican and Italian, which are two other main ethnic foods in America. So what happens is, you know, there was an era. Uh, not necessarily our generation anymore, but people really kind of kept kosher. And so, you know, or like someone in your family or grandma kept kosher. So you could go to Chinese restaurants and there's often this idea of, um, quote, safe trafe. Cause like the pork in Chinese food doesn't really look like pork. It doesn't look like ham. It doesn't look like bacon. So if you can't see it, it doesn't count. Um, so, <laughs> so you, I, I meet like some of my friends now they're like, my family doesn't eat 
like pork except in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Which I thought was like the funniest rule that they had. Like, like somehow it's like willing blindness. Um, so that's true. And then you know, three. You know, um, the the Chinese and Jews were you know were in close proximity in specifically New York City. So at a certain point, I think eighty percent of Jews are descended from someone who passed through the Lower East Side. And I used to know the I used to know the years. It was like eighteen seventy five to nineteen twenty five. Like, but it's been a long time since I give, I've given my talk. Um, and then, like, fourth, like, Chinese food just tastes good, right? Like, I mean, there, there's a reason there's, like, Irish people open bars and not takeouts, right? And so, uh, <laughs> actually, scariest, one of the scariest, like, ethnic, like, immigrant, like, hybrid foods, Irish Chinese food. They have a dish in Ireland, one of the most popular dishes on their Chinese menu. It's called three-in-one, French fries, fried rice, curry, all mixed together. F- some fusion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you tell them, that's not Chinese. And they're like, it's not? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, Chinese people don't do this, right? They say it's really good to eat when you're drunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Je- Jenny, Jenny, one of, the, one of the interesting things that I found was different from the book and the movie. There are many differences. But um, the movie takes this kind of this organizing kind of mystery. Who was this guy, General Cho? Yeah. The book takes a uh, kind of a different organizing mystery, which is how did the fortune cookie, cookies. which is an American invention, become this kind of ubiquitous symbol of Chinese cuisine? Um, I, I don't, I'm, you, we don't have the time to recap the entire right. history, but but could you talk a little bit about um, that that choice that Ian made to? to, to yeah, I think uh, so. One originally, remember my the name of my book was a long marker general. So so when I first wrote, wrote my book proposal, it wasn't clear that fortune cookies were going to be the organizing principle. Like uh, so. Um, you know, and it's really interesting as an author, the, the the gap between when you start your book proposal and your research and, like, when you conclude. So somewhere in my research, I was like, oh, fortune cookies are actually Japanese. And I actually went to Japan, and I found, like, the original fortune cookies, which are big and brown and not, like, yellow and sweet. Um, and so, like, when you put them together, it's, like, to- like, the family resemblance is, like, undeniable. And so at a certain point, I when I realized that or figured it out, fortune fortune cookies became my organizing principle and it and just as a structure of uh of an author as an author you want you you want an arc that moves kind of through and there's a beginning middle and end um you know and so for me one of the big mysteries was like so how did fortune cookies go from being japanese to chinese and uh what's nice is a lot of the families are still around the grandchildren uh so the sansei so the third generation japanese americans are still kind of hanging out and uh, and basically, I figured, you know, I kind of figured it out when uh, they all had very similar stories, which were like, yeah, you know, my family's been operating this bakery for a hundred years, except for that time when we were all locked up during the uh, Japanese internment. So it was actually during the Japanese internment that the Chinese came in and like took over the fortune cookie thing. Wow. So I like to say, <laughs> so I like to say that you know, fortune cookies they were like invented by the Japanese, popularized by the Chinese, but ultimately they're consumed by Americans. And I think for um, for the. Um, Actually, so that's like one of my main contributions to knowledge in the world, which is like it changed the Wikipedia page <laughs> on like fortune cookies and their history when that came out, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, whereas General's House, I think the you know Ian and and um, and uh, Kurt were were kind of wondering like who is this man? And I and one of the things that you'll notice actually in the documentary is um, that especially that clip when Bob Lape is talking. The problem with documentaries is you kind of need visuals for everything, and if you don't, you need to come up with one, So, which is why we actually have a lot of illustration. Whereas if you are like a writer, you can just interview people a lot and then like write. And so you can. there's a lot more hand waviness that you can do um, in reconstructing that you can't necessarily do as well in documentaries. I have one more question, then I hope we'll uh, tee up the audience to ask uh, some of your questions. I hope I haven't been taking up too much time. Um, Jenny, you've written very movingly about um, what I think can be described as the kind of the, the, the darker side of the world of, of immigrant restaurants in America. Oh, yeah, yeah. Workers, uh, many of them undocumented, who work. Many of them are living not too far from here. Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> a lot living far from here. Um, you know, the whole Chinatown bus system originated as a way to really distribute workers to small places and often as far as rural towns in Georgia or Ohio. Where these workers who you know don't have much culinary training are, are essentially, 
you know, working 18, 24 hours a day and then making runs back to uh, cities with substantial Chinese populations to have some kind of community and semblance of community. We're in a time in America right now of immense debate over the status of the undocumented. Um, we're also at a time of discussion about fast food workers and how much they should be making. How do you think these debates are going to play out um, when it comes to Chinese food? Should we feel, should, 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 should conscientious people be concerned about, about li I mean, leaving aside health and environmental, <laughs> but concerned about labor standards when they enter a Chinese restaurant? How, how, how would yeah, you? Yeah, I think, I mean, so one, um, yes. And I think one of the more interesting examples has been around um, delivery workers delivery workers in New York City and one of the biggest battles was actually not technically over a Chinese restaurant even though it was owned by ethnic Chinese there was a restaurant called Saigon Grill uh, I think with both of us wrote a lot about it actually in uh, City Room actually fun fact we were co-editor-in-chief of a high school newspaper together so not not just junior high but sort of uh, kind of you know kind of was a reflection of our future career ambitions um, and to a certain extent I mean that uh, the so so our generation um you know, so English-speaking children of immigrants who get politically active, actually, I would say did a very successful job actually raising the issue of um, the labor, the workers getting screwed by their t from, from their tips. And the other day, I actually was trying to... And the, the, trick, the tricky thing for me was Saigon Grill actually has really good food, right? And it was actually one of the places that actually put Vietnamese food on the map. And I went to visit it the other day, and I walked back and forth, and I could not find it, and then suddenly realized the restaurant had shut down. So... Um, I actually think, if I remember reading, it, it was actually partially a reflection of the business, of, of sort of the impact of the boycotting, um, because half of their business actually came from delivery, and that obviously kind of, uh, the, the, the sort of picket lines around actually had an impact. So I do think that the, um, the, the, the labor standards, I mean, and they're slightly different than the McDonald's, you know, there, there are all kinds of other things that are kind of going on in there, have, have been interesting. And to the media's credit, I would say that um, New York City media has disproportionately kind of paid attention to this issue in part because everyone kind of relates to Chinese delivery men. You know, the other, the other area where they really pay attention to is like Chinese delivery men getting killed, right? So, so there's a lot of coverage of that, I think, you know, proportional to like their class. Um, and the you know the the police take the missing Chinese delivery men very seriously. There was one who was still trapped in an elevator. Or the, yeah. yeah, one of my favorite stories as a reporter was like a Chinese restaurant worker went missing, and I was in the cop shop at that time, and we like his bicycle was all there, and like all of us in the cop shop at that point were like, oh, of course, you know, just officially missing, but we all know because like when Chinese delivery men go missing, they kind of show up like you know floating somewhere, um, oh. and. Uh, they, I mean, the the cops. I mean, they they went all out looking for him. I mean, there were canines. I mean, they were um, they had scuba people, you know, helicopters looking for this this poor disappearing Chinese delivery man, and he turned out to be in the elevator. He had been stuck there for seventy two hours, but no one had noticed. Um, and so I actually covered that story. Just to me, it was what, just a what reflection. What about the person who ordered the food? I think he was on his way down. Yeah, is that right? I think they'd already gotten the food, right? Because they asked the person, right? So they, Where's my yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. Um, uh, th this has been terrific. I'd love to g hear some questions from the audience. Who wants to start? Don't be shy, folks. Oh my, right from the front. Okay, but then the back needs to be represented so when next. You, when you Hi, my name is Mary Lou, and I'm, I'm just a teacher. I was a teacher down here in Chinatown doing bilingual. Anyway. Um, when you first went to Hunan province, there wasn't much about General Cho. And then when you went back in 2013, say, then they have all these uh, liquor named after him, yeah. the school named after him, the museum. Plaza museum. What's in the museum? Is it a history about him? Yeah, I mean, it's basically, I mean, he was a, a, and he was a skilled warrior, right? So, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of imagery of General Cho. Um, and a lot of family, there's a lot of family stuff. So actually the man that, um, was giving us a tour. We don't we don't reveal this in the end of the um, documentary, but he is the great 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 grands five generations down from General So himself. So he's actually related to to General So. I mean, so you have like hundreds of people named So Joel like in that little um, uh, area. So it, there's also just a lot of like family history. They they don't have a lot going on in that area, so they really circulate. You know, it's, it's like certain like. When you go to certain parts of America and they're like really into like the local ba like Confederate like battle that happened there, yeah, that's kind of what it feels like. 
question from yep. Um, hi, um, I'm Yuning, and um, I'm a Chinese student from from Parsons. <laughs> um, I'm I'm from where the general souls from. Yeah, I'm from Hunan province. Changsha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Which is um, great food. And I grew up in a rural area, so I really uh, so that's why when I read your book, I I actually cried <laughs> because I was so tired and I miss home. Um, my question is, um, yeah, I'm doing a research paper for, for my school. Um, um, I'm doing a Chinese food in America, so um, I have a question. Um, since Americans don't eat like chicken legs or, or anything that has bones, um, and, and the ingredients in America is a little bit different from the chi uh, from the ingredients in China. So do you think we're losing the authenticity? In yeah, I mean, I would say, um, so one thing that's really interesting about Americans is they don't like to be reminded that their food ever swam, walked, like flew, oh, or I or like, <laughs> walk, you know, or ran, right? So so no no bones, no 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 tongues, no hooves, like uh, no claws. But, but, like, but some people like bone-in fish. But bone-in fish or I mean, uh, generally, like, eh, like, I would say we generally, like, our, our food arrives through immaculate conception in styrofoam trays at Whole Foods, right? Like, like, so it's really, and, 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 you know, I will, I will make the argument and I, I, I don't prove it, I guess, but I, I wish I could prove it. That part of it is because American cuisine actually uh, rises um, with refrigeration. So unlike m more ancient cuisines, like whether or not it's Italian or Chinese or like Japanese, you have to use the whole animal, right? And so you preserve a lot of, um, you just use everything. And, but the, by the time it gets to the United States, you kind of lose a duck blood, you know, or you lose, you know, tongue isn't as, or, you know, or, or ear. Um, so I think, I think generally Americans are kind of like leery of that, but there's also now that whole fo foodie thing. Like, have you, know, have you tried, you know, uh, you know, uh, chicken feet? Actually, I always, I, it's, they, they say they like chicken feet, honestly, but they don't like, so we always go to dim sum. We always go to Jing Fong, you know, whatever, which also has labor issues. I'm totally aware. And so, um, and we order chicken feet because then they feel like they're having real um, Chinese food, but they actually only eat the dumplings. Um, <laughs> and so then I eat all the chicken feet, right? And so it's... When it's, you're with Chinese friends or non-Chinese friends? Just non-Chinese non friends that, like, want to do the whole dim sum thing, right? So you always order the chicken feet so they, they feel like they have the authentic Chinese experience, but they don't eat it, right? So one of the more funny things, actually, um, in um, in China is that when I did my book, and it's probably still true, by volume, the, the second largest product being illegally smuggled into China after cars was like animal parts because there, there is like interesting arbitrage opportunities where like these parts are generally worthless in the, in the West and then they're worth a lot in the, in China. And so, so you will, if you kind of just go through and look at like, you know, kind of little newspaper articles, there's always articles about like some boat, like in, you know, going up the river from, you know, Guangdong province and like it hit something and out spilled like cow long or like chicken feet in like vast numbers. And I, so I, I think that arbitrage thing is really interesting actually. And also like dark meat just tastes better. Like chicken breast is tasteless. Did you have a quick follow up? Um, do you think authenticity is matter since um, Chinese food is really traditional not classic? Called, uh, like, I think for Chinese people, I think it does matter since it doesn't really taste like Chinese food. Yeah. Um, so one of the you know strong positions I take after doing my research is that authenticity is sort of a function of time and place, and so. Um, you know, there is a notion of like authentic Chinese American food. Like when you went to, when like all my reporter friends went to Iraq um, and served in the green zone and ordered Chinese food, it wasn't like Chinese Chinese food, it wasn't Middle Eastern Chinese food, it was American Chinese food. Like you could order beef and broccoli in Iraq, right? Because because the people, uh, the Chinese people there were cooking to the American, um, American taste. So in, you know, another example is in Korea, there's actually a chain of Chinese American 
restaurants where you can order General's House chicken in Korea because that's like a distinct cuisine within you know within the global scape. And uh, when, when I so it almost is its own distinct fusion cuisine, you'd say. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's distinct. Right, you can tell this is like real beef and broccoli. Or well, real I think our rolls. questioner, if I'm understanding right, though, are you kind of asking objectively which is better, like actual Chinese cuisine? <laughs> Um, I will say it's interesting. One of the things that has opened up in Shanghai recently is actually an American Chinese restaurant called Fortune Cookie. Wow. Which, which, which actually originally was designed for expats. So I got like so many phone calls from That's so many great. media outlets when this thing opened <laughs> up, there, which I haven't, I have, you know, I hadn't been in China since then, so I didn't have that much to say, but they still wanted quotes or whatnot. Now that, chi- but now Chinese Chinese people are coming Chinese to... Chinese people go to Fortune Cookie to eat American Chinese food because it's considered like cool, right? <laughs> right, because it's like exotic. And bizarre. <laughs> and it's different, right? It's like totally, its own thing. Totally now. fascinating. Sir. Oh, whoa, that's old school. <laughs> what I was saying, this is better, uh, I spent about three months in Changsha at the Hunan Medical College. And uh, you know, it was only three years after China was open. This is part of the Yale China program at the time. And we ate in the dining room most of the time. What was interesting and striking to me was mostly, veg- mostly vegetables, and it was exactly the same meal for six weeks in a row. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Until a new crop came in, and then we got that meal yeah. for the next six weeks. Is that typical of what happens in institutions or schools, or medical schools like that? So... So I can't speak to 1982, uh, but um, and then communism, whatever you know. But I can say I, I spent a year in um, Beijing University, also institution, also in the dining halls. Uh, of course, it was in Beijing at that time, and then we actually ha- did, did actually have pretty decent variety of vegetables. And I think that might have been just a reflection also of the economic situation, and also just the crops were coming in. Whereas in Hunan, you know, it is it, it was. I mean, it's rural now, relatively speaking, but like in 1982, it was like super rural, right? And so you, um, I mean, one of the things that we take for granted, I think, in the United States is like how unnatural the fact that like we have cherries and like, you know, random parts of the year are, I mean, like bad carbon footprint stuff going on everywhere. But, um, you know, basically I can go to a supermarket and, you know, if I'm willing to pay enough, I can get, you know, the produce that I want. And, you know, that comes to the cost and, like, whatnot. But it is, it's lovely in certain ways and totally bizarre in others. Mm-hmm. Very, very interesting. Uh, I think I saw a hand raised in the back. If not, raise one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good, good prompt. Sure. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I grew up in New York. And I do feel like there has been a loss of non-fast food Chinese restaurants in New York. At least what I... Remember, yeah, as a kid, I feel like there was one in every neighborhood, like the Ollie's type yeah, of yeah. restaurants. Yeah, yeah. They just don't seem to exist anymore. Yeah, I would say um, there are a couple things going on there. One is uh, the downward pressure of um, of Chinese, like Chinese food is considered cheap in American culture, so the margins are low. One of the more interesting things is a lot of quote Japanese restaurants in New York are actually run by Chinese people. They're own, owned by Chinese people. Like I can I can look at a menu and the colors of a menu and sort of the decor and tell you like this is owned by Chinese people just because the the standardness of their um, of the installations and the fonts and whatever are very uh, Chinese. And um, you know to a certain extent the older that older generation of restaurants they um, they had their kids, their kids went off to college, and parents were like, we're done, right? So part of it is just like the, the Cantonese generation and, you know, the so, Taiwan so generation. So like the Korean deli is the Chinese um, corn, is the Chinese local restaurant becoming an endangered thing? Uh, I think it depends what 
city. I think in other other places, what you will often have is actually um, buffets in much of the country is actually right. very common. And right. part of that's really interesting because the, the way that a buffet works from a sit-down restaurant, the economics are slightly different. So in a buffet, 40% of the cost is food, 20% is labor, whereas in a restaurant, it might be 40% of the cost is labor, 20% is cost in food. And the difference is in a buffet, you don't need English-speaking uh, waitresses. Mm-hmm. So that, and, you know, that has sort of become a phenomenon basically across like much of the middle of the country. So for my book, um, I actually uh, went to a bunch, like dozens of restaurants across the country where everyone had gotten fortune cookies and played a, the, a number from their fortune cookie and came in second in the lotto. So they had 110, I think they had 110 second place winners for a Powerball lottery where statistically they'd only expected like four. And, there, and, and what had happened is people across the country uh, you know, basically had used the same fortune cookie number, which which also weird because those are just the people that won. So think about all the people who are playing numbers that don't win on a regular basis. Very funny. Uh, yes, please. I like that you don't even your analysis about why Jewish people, the connection between Jewish and Chinese food, yeah. Chinese, even Chinese food, I like that analysis. I never thought about that. Um, I was wondering, you know, you frequently hear, you hear frequently hear about exotic ingredients, not just in terms of like chicken feed or things, but um, used for like fertility or um, yes, or uh, healing uh, after childbirth, right? Or, or, or male uh, virility, or, you know, something like Viagra, but in dust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> any any great stories to share? You know, about oh, those interesting. Kind of that's more, is that more about Chinese medicine, medicine than food? Yeah, I'm trying to think if I have any funny stories to share. I will say this, which is not exactly um, a funny story. So sea cucumbers, one of the most misnamed foods in the entire world, like grape nuts. Um, so they are <laughs> completely hideous. They kind of look like penises, and they are incredibly expensive and dried in... Um, in, in um, like flush, like you'll see them like dried and looking slug-like. They are not cucumbers at all. It's actually I, I remember actually t- telling my vegetarian friend I was like, you know, cucumbers are animals. They are not like vegetables, and she was totally surprised by that. Um, so one of the f- I, if, if you guys have not seen it, go home and Google sea cucumbers um, on, and you will be like frightened by that. But also um, very popular in Chinese medicine as well. Yes. Gooey duck looks like, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. They kind of look more like like clam, like, you know, the creature from Alien, like, merged with, like, clams in a way. I find it less freaky than sea cookie. Because they don't, they don't, they don't misname themselves. In I think that part of the disturbances about, about sea cucumber is the fact they're called sea cucumbers, and they're really, like, not cucumbers. Yeah. How are we? More. Yes. Um, I'm having difficulty trying to articulate my question, but I'm wondering if you can speak about the transformation of space around certain establishments um, in actually New York City, Chinatown. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Nam Wah Tea Parlor, where you know today it is the I mean, it's the oldest dim sum Chinese restaurant in New York, but right now it's it's a huge tourist attraction and. Right now, if you stand outside, without fail, you will see a line out the door. Right. But most of the people who are there are not Chinese people. Right. So what does that say about, I know we're talking a lot about authenticity, we're talking right. about what is better. Um, I don't know if you yeah. have anything to say about I do about actually that. have something. So, so this has actually been really, um, one of the fun facts um, in general is that the Chinatowns around the country all tend to be located in now really desirable real estate areas because the Chinese people all got there really early, right? And so uh, you often find that the Chinese and Italian neighborhoods um, are are close in close proximity because they, they basically reflect the waves of um, of immigration. And so, you know, Chinatown is in a fantastic location, you know, geographically relative to Manhattan. Um, in Washington D.C., so there are two things going on: one that they were, you know, early, and then two reurbanization. So um, one of the more interesting places is um, 
Washington, D.C., where, like, the Chinatown, really a China street, is now in one of the most, re like, urban design cores in uh, in Washington. And so, But it's weird, because they're like, oh, we should still pretend that this is, like, Chinatown. So there's a signage so requirement. There's a signage requirement. All, all, like, stores in Chinatown have to have Chinese names. So, you know, it'll say Starbucks, and it'll say Starbucks in Chinese, Xingbas, and then they'll Subway, and then... Uh, Ann Taylor Loft, my favorite actually is is Hooters. Hooters is in Chinatown, and so they translate that as Mao Tou Ying Chang Guan, which means Owl Restaurant. <laughs> That's also, how they translate Owl. There's a Verizon as well. Yeah, yeah. there's Verizon. It's, it's so, it's so, so it's really interesting, and as a result, you see um, you know, these, these sort of like secondary uh, Chinatowns have to spring up because... But so, but in places like Boston or D.C. or New York or, or even Philly. San Francisco, Philly, do you think gentrification threatens to, if not eliminate, at least really to kind of hollow out these Chinatowns? I mean, it, sometimes I think it depends on the way. Sometimes I hear that prediction that you know, in, in twenty or in twenty years or less, you know, Flushing and Sunset Park will be the only Chinatowns um, that that. People in, in, in Manhattan's Chinatown are already saying that they many of them commute in from these neighborhoods. Yeah, it's interesting because I like to point out to people that Flushing is actually the largest Chinatown in New York, and it's not like Chinatown anymore. Um, so it, I think it depends on the on the city, right? So at this point, like, not a lot of ch Chinese immigrants go flowing into um, Washington D.C., but a lot of Chinese immigrants flowing into Philadelphia. So Philadelphia's Chinatown, which used to be kind of sad, very sad, it was a, it was a, it was a very lame Chinatown when I was growing up, um, has become almost like the sixth borough for the Fujianese immigrants who themselves are priced out of um, New York City. And so, um, what you find, which is which is really interesting, the Fujianese, which um, who are sort of like the dominant, like at this point, like ninety percent of restaurant workers are probably Fujianese, um, which is um, you know sort of roughly kind of where like North Carolina and South Carolina would be in the United States. There are about 300,000 people missing from uh, that part of Fujian. Most of them have come here to sort of like serve and cook and make and deliver China General's House chicken. What's been interesting about, um, about the Fujianese experience is they basically see America in like two states, which is basically New York City and everything not New York City, right? So, <laughs> so they actually really literally have a term which is called white zo, which means out of state, right? But like white zo is like, like Albany is white zo, even though it's technically in New York State. And so it's it's really interesting because they talk um, about white zo as though it's like a place, like oh, you know, the the toilet paper in white zo is so much cheaper. The schools are much better, right? Like oh, the um, the, the Americans don't understand, you know, Chinese food and white zoo. So conceptually, there is New York City and then, like, everywhere else. And I think that was one of the most interesting things that I discovered in hanging out with Fujianese, that every, everywhere was white zoo except for New York City. Now, is there, is there an East Coast, West Coast difference? I wonder, in, in places like California where you have fifth or, you know, fourth, fifth, or even sixth generation Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans, have you looked into how their relationship with their ancestral food differs from, you know, the East Coast pattern? Um, so it's so there are two things that are going on, which I think are interesting. So uh, last generation, like when we're in talking about like a hundred, I guess whatever, eighteen eighties, so and we're wow, we're getting really up there, almost one hundred and fifty years ago. The it was Cantonese immigration going west to east, right? So actually, in fact, a lot of the immigration pushed this way because of the anti-Chinese labor. Um, you know, uh, strife. I mean, it was all kinds of things. It was like, you know, shootings and lynchings and like, you know, bond. It was bad, bad, bad. And there are great, some great books about that. So whereas the Fujianese immigration is going from east to west. Um, and so there's some, there's some like little idiosyncratic, interesting things um, that come as a result of that. So one is, you know, those white takeout boxes, they actually are different on the East Coast versus the West Coast. They're oriented differently. Like the wire actually on, on one side um, runs the long way and the other coast it runs like the short way. And only in Houston do they meet. And what's even stranger <laughs> is that um, two thirds of all white takeout boxes are actually made by the same company called Fold Pack. So they're oriented in different ways depending on how the chef was taught to like kind of um, 
put his thumb in the like like they're they, they're kind of freaked out sometimes when like oh it's oriented wrong. So one of the there's like those one of the like funny things I like to do when you know they you know for films you write about like discontinuities or things that are illogic is that um, they'll often have scenes in in you know uh, movies where like you know whatever the guy goes into his refrigerator opens and it's full of you know Chinese takeout boxes which sort of shows he doesn't cook and the city will be like DC or New York or whatever. So it's supposed to be East Coast, but I'm like, ha, those are West Coast Chinese takeout boxes. <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so actually, thank you for smoking is actually one of those where like the boxes are oriented in the wrong direction. Doubles in the details. Yeah, so you should know. Okay, I'll try. Um, I've always been fascinated by the Chinese-run Mexican takeout restaurants, yeah. and I was wondering what the origin of those is and if they exist outside of New York City. Um, so it's fascinating, right? Because I they I actually have a really bad memory of those because I I actually ate at one of those right before I got hit by like a bicycle and passed out. And so when I came to, I vomited and I associate it with the with the it begins with fl- F floor floor. It was. Um, it was there was one on like Forty Second Street, um, and I now stay away from it. For no, no reason like associated with the food. So part of it was just, um, I think they also invented a, like a tortilla, a quasi tortilla machine. It's not really that tortilla like. They're more like scallion pancakesy kind of. Um, and so the part of it was just like the competition within Chinese food is so harsh. So you start branching out into other other things. And um, at that point. I, I, I'm, I can speak more, better in the 90s because I haven't paid attention to these as closely. New Yorkers weren't that discerning about Mexican food. And I still think, like, you know, one of the things that, like, people in L.A. and San Francisco still, like, criticize us for is, like, or Chicago. They're like, you guys don't know Mexican food. Right. Um, and so that was sort of a, an interesting kind of venue for the Chinese sort of evolve into. And they could kind of... Um, there are things that are actually very similar to, Mex- quote, Mexican preparation to Chinese food in terms of like stir fry, but they're called fajitas. Actually, another really fun thing is like Mexican Chinese restaurants in Mexico. Like there's actually a city called Mexicali, which is um, like kind of, it's, it's really interesting what happened. It's like they, they basically were going to build a railroad there and uh, they were, then the railroad like companies were like, just kidding, and left all the Chinese people kind of hanging out in, oh, in, in Mexicali. And so as a result, there was um, a lot of Chinese restaurants there. And, and it's, it's interesting to see their interpretation of Chinese crunchy, thin noodles. Um, there you get served like fried tortilla chips. And instead of like small cups of hot tea, you get really large cups of sweet, cold tea. Um, and then a lot of things basically look like fajitas. Right, so Chinese, and they still serve chop suey there. Like chop suey is still like a very active thing in the Mexican Chinese. Young woman in the back. So, because you just mentioned chop suey, I was wondering if you've ever heard of American chop suey, which is yeah, like the well, they served it in our elementary school. It was like macaroni and cheese with with ground beef, right? Yeah, so I grew up in the Boston area and that was like the dish in my neighborhood. All of the moms made it, my mom made it. You'd go to another person's house and it would be American chop suey. So I feel like it's kind of taking the chop suey that was made for Americans and then naming it (laughs) with a Chinese name. But it's nothing like chop suey. Nothing like chop suey. No, I had it too. And you know, chop suey in Chinese, um, or in, sorry, so chop suey is the Cantonese pronunciation in Chinese, it's Zasui, which means like um, odds and ends, and so I like to say it's the biggest culinary joke that one culture has played on another. Because you had all these like Americans going back. I mean, they thought they literally in the 1920s. It's it's actually great um, reading the coverage of chop suey in New York City during that time. Like New York Times has been a fantastic newspaper for a really long time. Like you don't actually get that same depth of coverage even in the Washington uh, Post or the LA Times. And so like it literally became this like phenomenon. Like 1880, 1896 onwards. And um, chop suey is where you uh, went to impress a date, and you want to seem sophisticated. It was like cool. I mean, it was, it was it was the thing. It was the national dish of China. And then you get to like the 1920s, and there are a bunch of articles from like people going to China, and they're like, "Where's chop suey?" Like, I've asked everyone about it, and it's clearly not the national dish of China. Like, what's going on? So you see this like slow revelation of like, "Holy cow! This is like we've all been had, right?" And so um, it's. So it's like, and they're going around asking for it. So it's like a Japanese person coming here and saying like, 
so I understand you have this really popular dish called leftovers, and it's especially popular after that holiday of yours called Thanksgiving. And you're like, yeah, you know. So <laughs> anyway, how are, you, are we? How are we good? I'm tired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I did well. Yeah, yeah, I've done this, right? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, hour and 12. She said it was going to be an hour and 15, and it's been an hour and 12. Um, I don't know. Uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I, if anyone has one last, we'll do one last question. It's like, it's hard being on for like, you know, an hour or so. Well, are you continuing, did you, um, are you continuing to look at the, the, no. the future of Chinese food? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 I'm done, I'm done. Actually, one of the reasons I started a Silicon Valley startup is so I have something to talk about other than Chinese food. Um, but then we they came out with this documentary, which is fun. It's like fun to produce a documentary, you know, like in my spare time when I'm not raising money from investors, I produce <laughs> documentaries that are in like the Tribeca Film Festival. And when you eat out, do you ever go Chinese? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, kind of? Let me think. Let me think about that. I can't, um, re I can't recall a meal with you at a Chinese restaurant. In any yeah, I mean, it's sometimes... It's... Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes... I mean, it's, it's interesting because I travel so much because I, I would say, like, my average speed during uh, a month is 50 miles per hour if you factor in all the flying and stuff. So... Do I eat Chinese food in San Francisco? Not really. Um, sometimes, sometimes. Actually, there's a restaurant that was around. There's like a totally legit Chinese restaurant like downtown. That, I mean, um, in the financial district. And then sometimes we'll um, I'll meet people for Chinese food in um, San Francisco. Like the, the it's, it's it's a very funny phenomenon in San Francisco, which is like all the really good Chinese restaurants are, have are named after two letters, so R and G Lounge and Z and Y. I don't, I, it's it's not something that you see here. And do I eat Chinese food? Yeah, I mean, you know where I like to go eat. Um, I don't, I wouldn't consider it necessarily out, but one of my favorite places is um, Xi'an Famous Food, which yes. is um, yes. you know Muslim Chinese food or Western Chinese food has become sort of a phenomenon. Um, here in thanks to actually a, a student named Jason who or he's not a student anymore but he, he I actually met Jason when I gave a talk at um, Washington University in St. Louis and he came up to me and said his his father had opened this like Xi'an like sort of eatery in Flushing and he's like totally taking that concept and like ran with it and like built his little empire and has been as Zagat 30 under 30 and stuff so I always like to he always um he still gives, and we order, actually, here's a total good advice. If you ever have to cater for a large crowd, ordering um, from Xi'an Famous Food is actually one of your best deals because it's not expensive at all, but it looks really exotic. So if you deplate, like if you kind of like order a lot, but like put in fancy plates, like people are very confused and think, are very impressed. <laughs> so that would, that would be like one of, I've like done like, you know, $500 like fundraiser fancy dinners, like using um, Xi'an Famous Food. <laughs> I mean, I think the trick is probably the game is probably up now because it's been now they're like, you know, see on famous foods in like Midtown East and Upper West Side. But like, you know, about like four or five years ago is definitely like my go to trick. Jenny, we've had hundreds, if not thousands of conversations over the years, but this is uh, one of the easily one of the most fun and, <laughs> and fact filled. So yes, thank, you, thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you, thank you. to the audience. <laughs> I also um, want to thank you both and thank the audience. The questions tonight were wonderful. And I, there was so much excitement, um, and the excitement was palpable, but there was also a tension and, um, that I could feel in the air. And you know, there was an excitement. Everyone wanted to keep asking questions, but yet, for those of you who, like me, did not eat dinner yet, <laughs> there's that tension of, like, when can I go and get food? So um, that's my segue into um, the way now you can... You can you can go get you are you are in Chinatown too. You right. You even have a Japanese restaurant owned by Chinese people right around the corner, and then also um, Russ and Daughters. So to flip <laughs> what we were talking about earlier, and though we Russ and Daughters is a, a restaurant or a, a store that's been on Orchard Street um, since 1914 when Joel Russ sold herring out of a barrel. And the pickled herring. <laughs> and now the fourth generation, Nikki and her cousin Josh, have opened a really wonderful cafe with excellent drinks. And a, it's a really good play on tradition. So anyways, if you buy <laughs> a book here tonight, and we highly recommend buying Jenny's um, book on the fortune cookie, which she will be here to sign, um, you can take that book and that receipt, and you get 15% off here, and then you get 10% off your meal at Russ and Daughters tonight. So if you want to continue this conversation and have food, 
the party goes on. Um, and um, so please um, have a good evening, and please join me again in thanking our wonderful speakers tonight.